Dear ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to be here with you on the COVID-19 space. It's on sedation and delirium, and I will join the next minutes together with you. What is the agenda? The agenda for sedation is what are the milestones of sedation research? What is the state of the art? How do we measure sedation in 2019? What is the management of sedation? And on the delirium, what is delirium? What impact has delirium? Is haloperidol useful? And do we, how do we manage delirium? So coming to the first step is the first steps on um, a change in sedation management was 20 years ago. And there we had daily sedation interruption versus standard care. The idea was to have the patient more awake and check if the patient is awakeable. And that was the first randomized controlled trial on single center medical uh, ward, ICU, and what you can see here is that mechanical ventilation, ICU length of stay, hospital length of stay, and mortality was reduced if <clears throat> you have a daily sedation interruption. The next step was that um, we checked if uh, daily sedation interruption and um, the um, spontaneous breathing trial combined um, is better than spontaneous breathing trials alone. The idea behind is that if you have a more awake patient, you have a better muscle control, you can contribute to your spontaneous breathing trials. So what we did is that a randomized control trial, a multi-center trial that was performed showed that mechanical ventilation is um, improved. We have um, um, less um, ICU stay, hospital length of stay is reduced, and we had a better one-year mortality rate. So next step was Lancet paper 2010, now 10 years from that first study that was published. And what we did there is that first line sedation versus last line sedation, that means keep the patient awake, cooperative, so the patient can communicate versus last line sedation, that means sedation is, um, that means sedation is uh, performed in that way that we, on one hand, the patient is kept awake, on the other hand, the patient is um, sedated and um, that way that uh, we have an initial sedation protocol and that was not necessary these days. It was the first real study that showed that we can really have patients in the ICU that do not require any sedatives. And I think this was very important because this was a new idea and it was single center mixed ICU. And what we found out is that we also had a better control on mechanical ventilation, less um, ICU days, less hospital days, and also mortality was in tendency, but not significantly reduced. So in this study, again, awake, cooperative patients are better than patients um, that are sedated and that doesn't make sense to sedate them. So the next study was um, um, Mitter's group and what they did is they had a daily sedation interruption versus an awake patient. So the point is, that we don't interrupt sedation anymore, we keep the, kept the patient awake. So if the patient is not requiring any sedative, this patient did, did not receive um, sedatives. This was the first time that we had a target controlled sedation. And I think this is very interesting that there's no difference. I think this is important, no difference. So daily sedation interruption is not necessary and it's not necessary to really control with sedatives the interactive um, potential um, uh, with the patient. So the patient can interact and the patient can have a better um, workload, a higher compliance, and they can better be um, 
be in touch with their relatives and with the staff. So the next step was um, that we did a retrospective analysis that was done um, from Shehabi's group. And they showed that if you keep the patient not deeply sedated versus deeply sedated patients, you see that the ventilation time with um, patients that were deeply sedated was increased compared to those that were not deeply sedated and also mortality was better if you don't deeply sedate your patient. This was done in different countries, also in Malaysia, it was repeated by Shehabi's group, and we also did that in our ICU, so we checked in our ICU if this is true, we found the same results. So this was reprodu reproducible results. And what we also found out is that it has a long effect, a two-year mortality effect. What you can see here, the initial reduced uh, mortality rate by not sedating your patient too deep is prolonged up to two years. So this is very important to show that a short period can change the whole life. And this is very dependent on what ICU you will come. And this is also very dependent what the culture of the staff and what the train, training level of the staff is. So it's important that the training level of your staff is that you have awake patients only sedating the patient if they require sedatives. So that means deep sedation was replaced by daily interruptions versus no sedation versus target controlled sedations. So the key message is from the guideline, the patients should be awake, the rush should be zero or maximum minus one. Daily sedation interruption is not superior to a protocol-based light sedation management. That means according to a target control. And the most important thing is that the goal-directed management should as early as possible. So it's in a sub-management as soon as possible. It's, it's possible you should really replace um, your management from, um, for example, shock management initially to a goal-directed management. That means usually this requires, usually in the ICU, you should maintain um, uh, that uh, management for the whole period that should not be changed. Early goal-directed therapy is that you have a, a target that means zero or minus one, then you, then you have a test with the patient, then you treat the patient according to the test, then you make again a target control, have another test, etc. The only um, response that's not included here is on um, increased intracranial pressure, that's for sure. And uh, then you have a deeper target, but in all other settings, you should keep the patient as awake as possible. And this means usually zero minus one. So what do we use? What measurements? The Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale is one uh, option. So usually you have zero, that is a lot and calm. I think this is, too much green. <laughs> so I think we need a zero minus one that's green and all others are red for me. This is deep sedation and unarousable, so the patient cannot be reached. Um, this patients can be um, reached by voice and by um, all the patients are restless, agitated, very agitated, so as a positive uh, scoring and you have a negative scoring that's for deeper and deeper and deeper sedation until it's unarousable. And the usual, the, the, the frame is zero minus one that you would like to have. The point is the minus one means that the patient can stay in contact with you for at least 10 seconds. So this is very important. If the patient cannot contact you 10 seconds, you should be um, curious what's happening with that patient. So my question first is, you have a 60-year-old patient that has been admitted to the ICU for COVID. 
has a history of COPD. The core temperature is high. Current rust is minus five. Patient is intubated and ventilated. Nobody knows why the patient is minus five. Patient is intubated and ventilated with a PEEP of 12 uh, over 20 with an FEO2 of 0.65. What would be the most adequate first measure? So what's your answer? Please check now. So it is to define a target rust. And it's very important that you define it. And this should be the most adequate rust that it's achievable. And I think in these patients, um, if, um, if you have a rust of minus five, this is at least in, in this patient, it's too deep. Which pharmacological agent should be used if deep sedation is necessary? So you can look on the different symptoms you have. I think one is pain, check first for pain, then for hypnotics, then reduce the stress. Muscle relaxants are usually not required. So the first line is opiates and propofol. And if you want to reduce the stress, you have alpha-2 agonist adjunctively, you can use ketamine and uh, NSAIDs only if, if the patient benefits from that. Alternatively, if there's a short situation, for example, after cardiac surgery, valve replacement, etc., if, if your patient has, for example, endocarditis plus COVID, all things can happen, then the alternatives are optional volatile anesthetics and benzodiazepines. For muscle relaxants, you can use um, non-muscular plugging agents if required, but this usually is not the case in COVID. So you usually don't need any muscle relaxants. So important again, early goal-directed therapy, you should have the uh, Richmond sedation scale that's here again. So you know this uh, sedation scale now and you can check, is the rust scale superior to other sedation scales? Um, so maybe you use another one you can use every sedation scale that's better than using none. But the rest scale is superior because the entire psychometric properties are higher. And if you look on the study published on that, you can see here that different uh, psychometric evaluations were used here with the different scores. And the weighted score that's uh, most appropriate um, is uh, the best for the RAS. I think it's there are different there are different criteria. Who's interested can, can read that, but you sh I think one of the most important thing is the that the the level of the rust goes um, to di both directions, and this is giving you a better um, inter interator. So next step is. If you have sedation reduced, you check for pain, you check for stress, and then you check also, please, for delirium. Very often in oversedated patients, you cannot check for delirium because they are oversedated. And um, this is um, important that both the new um, awake and cooperative patients and the COVID patients, you check for delirium. Many of these patients were very delirious. And what is delirium? So delirium is not chronic. It develops over a short time. It's acute and it tends to fluctuate during the course of the day. It's very important that you check for disturbed attention and disturbed awareness. Um, that's one of the points. So orientation to the environment is one point that you can can focus, then can you can sustain um, attention. That's very important. And the other point is that you have a disturbed cognition. So you maybe have memory deficits or perception deficits. Importantly, it's not related to a pre-existing neurocognitive disorder. It's also not related to coma. And it requires a medical condition. 
Um, the point is, if it's not related to COVID and over sedation, it's not over sedated patients are not defined to that um, to that new definition of the DSM-5 as delirious that was different with the old definition of the DSM-4. So it's important that you have over sedation on one hand uh, checked for and um, also for the um, for the delirium. And it requires a medical condition. That means um, any um, a situation that's um, uh, relevant for that, for example, a surgery or, for example, a withdrawal, that's important uh, points. Additional symptoms like in the ICD-10, for example, where sleep disturbances are included, that's not in the definition of the DSM. And also hallucination and psychotic symptoms are not symptoms of the DSM. But they can be there, but that's not uh, in the definition of that. So encephalopathy, has, uh, that means delirium has etiologies and the medical condition um, is relevant. So you can have critical illness, you can have sepsis, you can have inflammation, you can have perfusion anomalies, you can have anemia. And in this setting, um, this gives you an encephalopathy, encephalopathy, and this has clinical manifestations like delirium, coma, seizures, or motoric disturbances. And all these clinical manifestations helps if you know the differences the most important thing is that coma is not included in delirium with a new definition. So this is very important. And the others are also different, um, it have different um, manifestations and definitions. So for the delirium incidence, is, this is high. So you can see here, for example, after surgery, you have uh, from 5 to 75 and in ICU patients, you usually have at least 20% up to 80%. It depends very much um, on the situation and your ICUs, how they are um, organized. Do you have a high-end ICU or do you have an IMCU combined with an ICU? So we'll have different frequencies there. How can physicians screen for cognitive impairment and delirium in clinical routine? Most important thing is you measure it by any delirium score you know and your team is trained for. So it's important if you don't take your temperature, can't find a fever, as you can see here. So this is uh, the, 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 the physicians, the nurses, and these are trained persons with the ICDSC. This is another delirium score. So if you are trained, you can find it. This is the most important um, situation. And if you're a nurse and you're beside the bedside, you probably see it more often than a physician that's not at the bedside all the time. But in, most, in both patient groups, any training improves that you better detect it. So detection is one of the most important things. How can you detect it? And one option is the confusion assessment method. This is used in many of the ICUs worldwide. We also use it in our ICUs. We don't use it, for example, in the recovery rooms because this requires trained stuff. So patients, um, for, the, for the patients, um, for the detection of delirium, you need to um, train your staff on this um, delirium score. So what is the confusion assessment method for the ICU, the CHEM ICU flow sheet? You check, that's what I said initially, with the DSM, acute change or fluctuating course of mental status. So if that's not fluctuating, if it's not acute, the patient has no delirium. If it's fluctuating or acute, then you check for inattention. So I will show you the, um, uh, the inattention test here. Um, so you can uh, spell or 
the letters of a word that usually have A's in it, and you say to the patient that the patient has to quiz the hand for the A, you will see that in the next uh, movie. If the patient, uh, the patient can have two errors, can make two errors, then the patient has no delay. But if the patient has three errors or more, then the patient, uh, then you check for the current rust level. If the rust level is not zero, um, other than zero, that the patient is ChemICU positive. If the rust is zero, you check again for disorganized thinking and you ask the patient questions. And if the patient has um, a zero, zero to one error, the patient is negative. If the patient has more than two errors, the patient is positive. I check here if you can see that. Oops, sorry, I'm not sure if that's working. I'm sorry for that. I'll check again if that's uh, possible to. No, it's not. Um, okay, Axel? Mm, we have a problem with that, so it's not, maybe um, I tried to, say, so now it's working? Okay. So if the patient is chem ICU positive, what will you do? First, it's very important that you consider differential diagnosis. What is the reason for that? Does the patient have infection like in COVID, withdrawals, acute metabolic trauma, CNS pathology, hypoxia deficiency, endocrinopathies, acute vascular toxins or heavy metals? And the, the, the memo is, I watch death. So step two is to re remove the delorogenic drugs, benzodiazepines, any sedatives, medication with sedative side effects, ketamines, um, hallucinations that mimic delirium, and drugs with anticholinergic burden. You can check here what are these drugs. For example, also antibiotics are in that range. Step three is, do non-pharmacologic measures. That means during the daytime, stimulate the patient, early mobilization, early enteral nutrition, cognitive stimulation, reorientation, daylight, it's important. Always avoid sedation, pay attention to the treatment environment at night, promote sleep, be silent, have light reduction, offer earplugs and sleeping masks, and only essential methods during the night should be done not anything that can be delayed until daytime. Step four is start with symptom-oriented treatment. So for pain, use opiates. For anxiety, use benzos. For stress, use alpha agonists. For sleep, use melatonin. Or for productive psychotic drugs, use neuroleptics. That's also published in the guidelines. So a patient has a new diagnosis of chem ICU positive delirium. What is the most adequate first treatment step? What would you say? Okay, it's an assessment of the underlying cause. And this is important because the underlying cause, if you don't treat that, you cannot really improve the delirium. And all other steps are very, very important. Also do the non-pharmacological measures and also do the things with the patient that's related to the patient's symptoms, not give the patient, for example, hypnotics if the patient has pain and other things. So really check for the symptoms and uh, do a symptom-oriented treatment. So at the end, I would like to close, I hope,
It will help a little bit for your sedation and delirium practices and uh, more weekends, so Thank you very much.